I'm here at Road with Ryan Burke, who's like the resident genius on all things microphones here. He's also the export sales manager, but he's been giving us an incredible education on what happens here. We're in this awesome place. It's really, really loud here. What are they doing here? What an introduction. Well, in here is, is kind of the, the birth of, of the microphones. This is where they first start out. This is the machine room where we'll actually machine the back plates for capsules. We'll machine the bodies of shotgun microphones and the, the kind of smaller miniature microphones. Um, and basically any of the spines for the incest of the microphones as well. So this is where you know a microphone comes from like a raw material, like a brass or an aluminium, and becomes a microphone. Wow. Can you show us what some of this looks like? Yeah, sure. So right here you can see some of the finished products. So one of the more interesting ones, you can see the brass raw body of an NTG3 here. So this is an NTG3. That's an NTG3. Before it's painted and everything else. Exactly right. So what will happen to this? After this stage, it starts as like a, as a, a solid brass bar. Uh, it gets machined in these lathes here, the big long lathes. Uh, and then what happens is that'll get uh, glass bead blasted to give it a nice kind of surface area. And then it'll either get ceramic coated or it'll get plated, depending on whether it's the silver or the black version. Wow. So then you, so you basically put the capsule, it fits in there, the electronics go down there. Yep. Wow. The uh, XLR plug goes into the end into there. The end there. And there's your... Uh, the start Ooh. of a shotgun microphone. Beautiful. Some of the other stuff that we've got here at the moment um, is the bodies of the video micro. Right. Video mic me. So this is the one that uh, you can use for iOS devices for filming. Sure. Uh, with like a little short kind of uh, interference tube at the back just to kind of give a bit more directionality to the high frequencies. Uh, this is the same kind of design, but that's for on camera. So it's a video micro. Right. Uh, and you can see, I mean, this is a, a microphone that comes in at a really low cost uh, at, at the you know kind of retail level, uh, but it's still machined on the same kind of lathe that we make our, our really, you know, kind of premium microphones on. And this is aluminum? Yeah, yeah. Aluminium. Aluminium, right, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that's it. Depends on where you're at. There. Where you're at in the world, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Beautiful. Yeah, cool. So let's um, have a bit of a look at the sure. process. So you can see here, this is the kind of material that goes into the machine. It's a solid bar. And then we'll actually remove material using this machine here. They're about three meters long. Uh, right. So about, you know, kind of 10 feet long, the, the, the bars that go into the machine. And what happens is we set these up and they can run 24 hours a day. So wow. We can set them up, you load in a whole bunch of bars and they'll just keep running through, keep producing microphone bodies or whatever part they're making. How many of these can they make in an hour? Oh, geez. It, it depends wow, on the Wow, there's product. stuff coming out there, right there. Yeah, yeah. So you've seen the swarf come out there. It, it entirely depends on the product and the complexity. So uh, some parts might take up to 12 minutes to machine. Oh, wow. Others will be done, you know, in a few seconds if it's a smaller part. Something like this might be a couple of minutes. Uh, it entirely depends on the design of the part, so... Wow. It can actually be one of the, the big bottlenecks with manufacturing is, is how long does it take a particular part to be machined? Uh, because, as you can imagine, 12 minutes, for instance, for yeah, the, right. the spine of a particular microphone, right. you can't do a whole lot within a 24-hour yeah. period, so you need more machines then. So how many of these machines do you have? So we've got... Geez, it grows every time I'm in here. We've got six at the moment. Right. Um, within a few months, we'll probably have eight. Wow. We've, got, we've always got another one on order because it actually takes quite a while to get them specced up and brought in to the, to the factory. So, I mean, I went away on a business trip and came back and these two were here. So oh. it's kind of like it's growing pretty fast. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, then what happens after all this? Cool. So I'll see if I can find a back plate and show you that side of it as well. Uh, it looks like we're not we're not manufacturing backplates at the moment. Yeah. But we also manufacture the brass backplates before they get machined to their final finish sure. in here. And what happens from here is they go into our other main manufacturing facility just next door, uh, where we'll actually start turning them into a real microphone. Awesome. Uh, let's go check it out. Let's check it out. Yeah. All right. So this room is our transformer manufacturing room. Yeah, I can see all this awesome copper. They look giant magnets yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Exactly right. So I mean, this is the newest space at Road. Uh, we started manufacturing transformers for our NTR ribbon mic. Yep. This is the Rode TR1 Ooh, transformer. That is heavy. Kind of, yeah. So one of the challenges we had with bringing out a really nice ribbon mic was that 
transformers can be very expensive to get a really well spec transformer and that's something that's got a really low impedance so that you don't have you know the signal trying really hard to get through the transformer and then having a lot of noise so ribbon microphones are traditionally really noisy our ribbon mic has 15 dba of self noise which is less than a lot of other manufacturers condenser mics wow which should be a lot quieter should so, be right yeah um so this is the tr1 transformer it is a 10 to 1 step up ratio i believe and then that's wow. going straight from the ribbon element into the transformer stepping up and then it goes into our active circuit which just does a, a gain boost it doesn't do any kind of any signal processing it doesn't have any eq to it or anything like that and so. it's really wild that it's a ribbon microphone that requires phantom power yeah yeah that's it so traditional ribbon microphones could be damaged by phantom power yeah. because if you ran phantom across that you know kind of really thin element you, you could burn it out you get that nice smoke smell exactly yeah you, when you let the magic smoke out of a microphone it just <laughs> doesn't work magic anymore smoke, yeah, exactly. yeah. so we keep the magic smoke in by having an active circuit so that you can phantom power it uh, that way you're getting a, a more robust signal as well. Uh, so our ribbon takes 48 volt phantom power. It'll give you an output very similar to a condenser mic. So rather than needing a dedicated ribbon pre. Yeah, it's which, loud. Uh, yeah, it's, it's super really loud. loud. So, and really clean. And the nice thing about having such low noise is that you can actually EQ the top end because every ribbon microphone, just due to the nature of the actual element, has a kind of more rolled off sound in the top. Yeah. Uh, and you can actually EQ our ribbon without just bringing up the noise floor in those frequencies where the noise usually lives. So and you get the, that awesome, rich ribbon microphone yeah, sound. Yeah. And one of the, the key aspects of that is a really nice transformer. So Beautiful. Yeah. Making them ourselves means that we can make them really highly spec'd at the right price and we can bring out a microphone that's you know incredibly well priced for the, the performance of it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Let's uh, keep going. Okay. Do. So where are we now? More big machines. Oh yes. So this is our. This is one of two surface mount electronic lines. What is that? So we manufacture as much as possible. We do surface mount components on our microphones. Uh, surface mount means that you, when you've got resistors, capacitors, you know, all the different components that make up the electronics of a microphone, yeah. we have them surface mounted on a circuit board, uh, which we'll see just in a minute. Oh, yeah. um, the idea there is that. When you have the components really close together, you can actually make sure that they stay very quiet, the microphone. So you obviously want as little self-noise as possible. And especially these days when you've got so much RF flying around every yeah. space, you wouldn't have had, you know, 50 years ago, you didn't have 2.4 gig flying around from everybody's wireless no. devices, iPhones, you know, digital TV. Uh, so these days it's very important to have a circuit very close together and really well shielded. And you can do that with, uh, with surface mount electronics. Uh, so in-house here we manufacture what is actually the quietest studio condenser mic in the world, which is the NT1. It's got only 4.5 dB. Wow, so crazy. Noise, which is cra it is really, really low. Wow. So, I mean, typically you'd find at least 10 dB of self noise mm -hmm. in, a, in a condenser mic. So. so why are you running around with film reels everywhere? <laughs> so this is, uh, this is basically the way that you'd load up a surface mount electronics line. Uh, right behind you here, you'll see uh, a storage tower for some of the more sensitive components, but they're all on reels. So this, these two towers here will basically keep the components at the right temperature and the right humidity. Uh, and this is kind of for more sensitive things that might get damaged by moisture, um, just to make sure that they stay pristine before they go onto the board of a microphone. Now, the reason they're on reels is because they'll go through an automated machine that'll be able to manufacture the boards regardless of how many people are in the room. So. Part of the success that we have at Rode is manufacturing a really nice product at the right price. And we can do that because you can have a single person running a surface mount line and manufacture you know, over a thousand microphone boards a day. Wow. Which is crazy. Can yep. we see one of those, how yeah, those things let's, work? Uh, let's check it out. So basically what happens, I'll grab a blank here so we can have a look. So a microphone board will start out like this. This is actually an NC1. So this is the microphone board. Oh, this is the board in the that one. That is the quietest one. Um, so this is just a blank board. You've got all your kind of trace lines through there yeah. that are joining up the components. But you, you see here all the, the kind of open contacts. Sure. So what happens is it gets loaded up. We'll, we'll put a whole stack of boards in here, maybe 50. And then they'll automatically run through this machine, which is like a screen printer that screen prints solder paste onto mm. each one of these contact, contacts here. So it's automated. It's just like they do when they screen print T-shirts. Uh, except when the blank goes on there, it's just screen printing the solder paste onto the, the raw contacts. So the ink is actually ICs in various little bits. Well, no, not exactly. The ink is actually the the metal, like the solder oh, that the you solder, would normally yeah. have to do, you know, with a soldering iron and, and sure. do it manually by hand. This does it all at once, and it's kind of like a gooey paste that the components will stick to in the next process. Wow. 
So then it, the board will come through automatically oh, yeah. into this machine. And this is where you see all these reels of components. So you've got a bunch of different resistors, capacitors, all sorts of yeah, electronics. Look at that. In these nice little neat packets so that they're always protected from moisture. Um, and this machine will pick up all those components and just stick them down. And because of that solder paste, they actually stick to the board. Wow. And then what happens is they keep moving through and they'll I go love, into the next machine. I love that Rode Microphones actually uses film reels to put stuff on <laughs> exactly. the microphones. I mean, that's exactly what this is. Yep. It's a film reel. You've got to live the life. <laughs> live the life. <laughs> that's awesome. So then onwards here, we're going to this big pizza oven looking thing. Uh, which Technical will, term. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's basically what is going to flow the solder and turn that into a real connection rather than just a solder paste that's sure. kind of a wet paste. Uh, it's going to gently heat up the components as they go through the machine. And we always make sure that you have to keep the temperature of this line below the kind of failure point of the weakest component. It's kind of like, oh. you know, the weakest link in Otherwise the chain. Otherwise it melts or something Otherwise horrible. Otherwise it melts, something will go wrong, maybe it goes out of spec by 2%. Right. Uh, anything like that we want to avoid. So you, you have a specification for every component and you have to make sure that you don't overheat the weakest component. So that'll determine how quick we can run this machine here. I see. And then once that solder's melted, uh, we've got, uh, uh, depending on the product that we're doing, we'll have a certain amount of boards on one kind of board here and then we'll kind of snap them all out, we'll test them all, make sure that they have the actual right, you know, kind of voltages running through the board uh, before it goes on to the next stage where it'll get paired up with a microphone body, a capsule, all the rest of it and become a microphone. Do you have these coming out the other end or we're not running right now? We're not running right now, the, the line's actually cooling down but we can see some on the all other right. side that Let's we've made that looks throughout like. the day. More cool reels. Oh yeah. Woo. So, I mean, you can see here what we've done. You know, this is some stuff for the, the last few days. Wow. Earlier today, it looks like they were making perhaps podcasters in this line. And basically what's happened is a production line wow. has been running uh, and it's finished. And you can see here this component board is, is fully loaded. So earlier today, that would have been stacked up. As the boards come in, it just Coming shifts down here. automatically. And once it finishes, somebody will get a notification, okay, this run's done. done. Come in and switch it over to the next product or put more product in there. So how much of this was done today? So we can do around 1,500 individual boards uh, in a day, uh, and each of these has about six or, or eight yeah. on them, uh, depending on the product. Uh, so wow. uh, today, it's hard to say exactly which out of these were done today, but this would have been from you know, at least the last three, four days to be able to get all these boards running. Again, if we find that exact same microphone that we were doing before, let's see if we've got any to hand. Here we go. So this is the final product right. of that same board that we saw. So as those uh, kind of little arms are placed in the components, these yeah. are the components that they're placing down. Then it got melted through the machine there, and then you have the finished board. Wow. And then that'll get tested just outside here to make sure that it's all up to spec. And there's somebody hand testing those. So these go into, it's, it's like a, they call it a bed of nails. And you can see all these open contacts here. Yep. These are all test points. Mm. So what happens is we put that in to a, a certain template that's set up for this particular microphone and it'll run a signal through every board and then it'll actually just throw up on screen which boards are out of spec uh, and we just put a cross on them and we don't use them. We don't, we don't try to repair don't try to individual them. components. Done. We're done with it. You know, we just take it out of, the, out of the line because we don't want to obviously have anything go out that's not right. you know, perfect. So, sure. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. One of so the we things, make the uh, boards and these, ex these things all get stamped basically. Yeah. And then what happens? All right, so then after the testing, these boards will get married up with a capsule. So we may as well go over and have a look at how the capsules yeah, are made. Yeah, perfect. This particular machine here will solder all of the through-hole components. So some of the components uh, that are too big to be able to be placed by that particular line in there with the surface mount, mm. things like heat sinks for power supplies yeah. or for amps, um, like you can see here, you know, these are all very loosely placed. So oh yeah, big hit sinks. But big things like that, larger capacitors that need to be a larger, yeah. larger part. Where we can, we surface mount, uh, but some parts just have to be a larger part, a heat sink, things like that that go through hole. And that'll go through this particular line here. Uh, in the same kind of process, it, it does a whole bunch at once. They'll go through and get heated up by these lamps mm -hmm. all the way along, and then there's a big flow of, of liquid solder that goes underneath wow. the bottom of the board. Like a big waterfall of solder. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and then what happens is that'll actually attach itself to all of the component contact points at the bottom without actually sticking to the board because the board's got like a coating that stops any of that from wow. making bridges. And then you've got, in one go, you've got a perfectly soldered board versus having an individual kind of sure. do 
manual labor sitting there of, forever of doing each that. one where you have a, a higher chance of getting you know kind of dry solder joints and all that kind of thing and you have the same thing here where you're only going to heat this up to the temperature of that exactly. weakest or lowest melting point component. Exactly right, yeah. So the, the minimum temperature that we can get the actual solder to stick to the, the components, basically. Right. Um, we can actually go a little bit higher in, in some ways with these because it's actually heating up underneath mm. rather than being a direct radiant heat on top of the, of the, the component itself. Wow. But uh, there's a lot more hand labor in this kind of process, as you can imagine, because somebody's had to place every one of these components in the correct orientation and everything like that. And what so, are these like for? What does this go to? So this here is a, a power supply for a, a, a valve mic, like a NTK or a K2. NTK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, over here, you'll see perhaps a podcaster. Uh, does it say? Yeah. So this is the podcaster, podcaster. which is a USB mic. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of you know little bits like um, like the rotary knobs for the volume control things like that sure. that we have on there. Yeah. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you'll see, but, but there's less and less uh, product in there each year. Fantastic. Yeah, Little micro, road spears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the Micro Burn Pole Pro. Sure. Uh, it's a carbon fiber burn pole, and when you've got all three pieces stuck together, it's only 125 grams. Yeah, it's so really light. So you literally light. hold it with a couple of fingers. You it's know? beautiful. The idea there is that, you know, whether you're trying to get into a really tight space, like a you know small interior shot or something, or if you're a single shooter and you're just trying to get your microphone closer, which yeah. we obviously always recommend to people. Always. Uh, that's the perfect product to be able to do that, awesome. especially with those lightweight microphones. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, so this room here is the diaphragm manufacturing room. Now, when you've got a condenser microphone, you've got the back plate and the diaphragm, which work together as like a capacitor to actually generate an audio signal. Mm -hmm. The diaphragm itself has to be kind of elastic. It has to be able to vibrate to the sound in air, and that's what's actually going to generate that electronic signal. Uh, so what we do in this room is actually manufacture those diaphragms for the true condenser microphones that require an external biasing voltage. NTG3, NTG8. Yeah, exactly. The, mm. the vocal microphones like the NT1, NT1A, K2, mm. NTK, uh, all of those large diaphragm mics, the NT series, so the NT5, mm -hmm. NT6, NT4, uh, they're all manufactured in this room. Wow. And the way that we do that is by getting some gold spattered mylar on a big sheet. Gold spattered mylar. Yeah, so mylar is like a kind of, uh, it's almost like cling wrap sure. kind of material, but it's really strong and you can stretch it out really taut and that's what's actually gonna vibrate with the sound. And that's actually coated uh, with like a pure gold. Is kind that of what plating. this stuff is? That's what that stuff is there. Yeah, exactly right. So wow. it's really thin. I'll get a bit of the stuff that we've actually manufactured. It's like a uh, candy wrapper almost, yeah. but a little bit more residual. Or, uh, Resilient. Yeah, much wow. larger sheet. So this is one that didn't quite make it. It might have popped off while they were... Oh, there you go. There's a bit a of an imperfection hole. in it. Yeah. So basically what happens is I could actually do... It's a much more scientific process than this, <laughs> but just to show you the basics of how it would work, you basically stretch across the mylar like this uh, on a jig, which has a tensioning rig that will go down on there and tension that mylar to a specified kind of tension. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll place a bunch of capsule rings around that mylar. Yeah, you can kind of see where it was once. Yeah, exactly right. So we'll place a bunch of capsule rings and then that'll hike up that tension frequency, mm -hmm. the resonant frequency, into a much higher frequency. So you can imagine if the, if the resonance is, is, you know, kind of under a thousand hertz here, it's going to be much, much higher once you put a smaller ring on there. Sure. Um, and that resonance is actually what you'll see on a response chart. You'll often see like a little presence boost on a, mm. on a especially like a one-inch diaphragm yeah. microphone. That's actually tuned at this kind of stage where you, you get that tension right so that it has a, a resonant frequency in an area that you want to boost the presence of the microphone. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, and so actually changing that tension radically changes absolutely. the frequency response of yeah. the microphone. Yeah, so you've got you've got that aspect of it. You've also got the, uh, the porting on the back of the capture where the holes are. Uh, the venting of the capsule is going to make a big, you know, kind of change to the sound of a, of a capsule. But this is one of the key parts of that. Um, Same with the speaker. You basically design it around that port, that hole. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. yeah. So so that's kind of what we do in this space. So we'll get the, the mylar to be stretched over. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of reel of mylar, which you can probably see just yeah, over see there that. in the corner. There's like a nice kind of clean roll of it. Um, that then gets tensioned uh, to a certain resonance mm. with a speaker. So you see the speaker just here. Oh, yeah. So what happens is these get placed above the speaker and then we play a frequency, a preset frequency, through the actual uh, diaphragm. 
the larger size of it, and then you'll actually just hear it vibrate in sympathy super loud as soon as you're on that right frequency. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, are they all, I mean, you've done tens of thousands of these. Do they all resonate kind of in the same frequency? When it has you to be know? exact. That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. So what we do is we, we tension it to the pr correct frequency. Uh, there's actually a laser interferometer that will measure these to make sure that they're at the right frequency. A laser what? Interferometer. Interferometer. Yeah. So we'll Fantastic. test them periodically to make sure that we, we've got everything perfect, Fantastic. which actually, it kind of measures the vibration of a surface. Got it. Um, and then what we do is we lay out these capsules so that they can actually rest because it's like a guitar string. When you stretch oh. it, it's going to eventually kind of loosen a little bit and then you have to tension it again. Mm -hmm. So we let them rest and then we retension them 24 hours later and then the actual capsule rings will get glued onto the These little guys diaphragm. Here. Yeah, so that's like a little screen printing jig for the capsules. This is the kind of brass ring. We've manufactured that in that same room that we just looked at. Yeah out of a solid bar of brass. Brass. And then that ring will get glued on top, and that way the, the mylar is at the right tension on that ring, and then we bake it in an oven. So it's a glue that we have to, obviously this material, you can't heat it up, because what happens when you heat that up is it'll melt, it'll change, it's a, it's a very delicate material. Sure. So we get it to like just kind of like a, a warm temperature so that the moisture evaporates out of the glue that we use. And then that way we can very gently over 24 hours dry that glue in these little ovens just over here. And then what happens is you end up with Perfect example right here, you've got some capsules that are kind of, these look like ones that have, have been rejected at the moment. So mm -hmm. the others have all gone through. Um, so we'll place it into this jig to be dried and then it'll go into this machine here, the next stage, which is laser cutting them out. Now a lot of other manufacturers use a razor blade and just cut around the outside of it and that's how you make a diaphragm. Mm. We like to do things with absolute precision. So we have sure. a, a laser cutter that wow. will actually cut the edge and it'll kind of melt off the edge and make sure that it's always perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And then basically that's how you have it. That's how you end up with a nice little diaphragm. Let's see if I can find Highly one. precision made diaphragm. Absolutely. And then over here you can see if I'm extremely careful. This. Wow, beautiful. Is the inside of a diaphragm. That's what's going to go against the back plate. Mm-hmm. And that's what the, the front looks like. That's what you're used to seeing when you're singing into a large diaphragm mic. So this is like NTK size. Yeah, yeah, NTK, NT1. It's a one inch, yeah. one inch diaphragm. Uh, that diaphragm will be common uh, across a couple of different capsules. Um, but this diaphragm will have a, a certain resonant frequency that might be in the NTK and the K2. And then we'll have a different capsule for, say, the NT1, which will have a different resonant frequency and it will go into a different back plate. But this is kind of where the art and the science of making microphones kind of joins together. So for people who don't know, we've just gone through that that's basically a mylar pulled, extremely yeah. taut thing and people don't understand how delicate microphones are, even just Absolutely. regular capsule microphones, to say nothing of ribbon microphones. Yeah. So, I mean, we could easily, if we were silly, put our fingers through that and it would go through. If you even touched it, you, yeah. would, you would potentially stretch it and it would stop working. Wow. I mean, to put it in, into context, right now this, this diaphragm's doing what it's gonna do for the whole life of the product, which is vibrating in sympathy with the vibrations of the air. Mm -hmm. So it's so sensitive that it's actually moving right now. The only difference is it's not up against the back plate that's gonna you know, act as the electronic capacitance. To, to create the voltage. The, yeah, to pick up the signal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there you have it. That's a, a, a diaphragm. That's how it's made. Man's okay. best version of an eardrum. So when did Rode make its first microphone and, and how did it come about? So the first mic was made in around 1992. Wow. Uh, and basically at that time, microphones, for a decent microphone, it was really expensive. You're talking a few thousand dollars. I know. Uh, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Rhodes kind of founder, Peter Friedman, uh, that's kind of when he started the company. Before that, it was his father's company and they used to make electronics. They used to run oh, wow. you know, PA systems. They manufactured some of their own PA systems. And he had this microphone um, which had a really nice capsule in it but really poor electronics. And he kind of pulled apart the microphone and fiddled around with it and made this really nice sound microphone uh, and went hang on a second this could really sell and at the time he thought you know if you could sell 500 microphones it'd be it'd be set um, I mean to put it in context this year we're on track to ship a million microphones what? so yeah wow. it's a pretty crazy kind of growth from there but that was uh, that was the start of road uh, the first microphone was actually the NT2 and we had the NT2 and the NT1 mm -hmm. that we launched uh, and those kind of carried on for years and now you know from those two microphones we've now got geez in the in the 
the microphone kind of range. There's more than 45 different products. Yeah. Starting out from the first two. Uh, and these and days, a whole lot um, of ancillary products as well. Oh, absolutely, over right. 100 accessories, yeah. Sure. Uh, and these days, I mean, you can see it's all manufactured in Australia, everything from diaphragms to bodies of the microphones to the electronics. Is it all here? Uh, yeah, it's all here. There's wow. there's a couple of bits and pieces that we order in, like plastics. Uh, sure. But as of this year, we're actually manufacturing our own plastics as well. So everything from shock mounts to, to you know, kind of stand mounts, um, the little bits and pieces that hold capsules, we can actually do that all in-house, and we'll see that in just a minute, the actual plastic assembly line. So, awesome. Yeah. So what's this place? It's so, like a, it says no cameras and we're here with a camera. Yeah, we're, we're always kind of breaking the rules here, but this is <laughs> a, uh, a, it's not in action at the moment, but this is the capsule assembly space. So when we've got our back plates mm -hmm. and we've got our diaphragms that we just saw there, it has to be a clean space. Everyone has to wear gloves, hair nets, shoe nets, you know. Wow, okay. Um, and this, this room here is a positive pressure chamber, which means that it's got higher t uh, air pressure inside than outside. So air's always flowing outwards and you don't have dust kind of floating in. Right. Uh, so it's a very clean space. Is you know, kind of a, a, a glued floor so that when you walk in, it takes all the stuff off your shoes and everything like that. Whoa. Um, and these little pods that you see in there are where the, the different components of a microphone capsule are married together. Um, and they're done by hand. Them. Yeah. Yeah, so that's done by hand, and then it's, there's you know certain tools that get them to a particular torque for each screw. Um, each of those kind of stations there has like a big vacuum behind them that sucks all the air out. So if there's any dust floating around, it goes straight out and doesn't end up in the microphone. And you can imagine with like a sealed microphone, like an Omni capsule, sure. the last thing you want is a tiny, even small little piece of dust inside between the back plate and the right. diaphragm because it's going to affect the response of the mic. So the way we combat that is by having a, a, a positive pressure chamber uh, with HEPA filtering on the input. And is this uh, the only the clean room like this that we have here? Not exactly. I mean, all of the spaces that we that we run, this is the only clean room to this to this level where we've got the positive pressure. So it's the only positive pressure chamber. But if you see throughout the, the factory, like for instance, in the surface mount line that we just saw there, as you walk through, you walk on like a sticky floor that kind of takes any of the yeah. dust off your shoes. Uh, the temperature of those rooms is controlled in a different way to some of the other areas that are less sensitive. Mm. Uh, the paint line has you know, a giant oven in the same space as a whole bunch of air conditioners to keep it at the right oh, temperature. Wow. It's like a big push-pull kind of wow. balance that we have to follow. So, so the, you're saying you're shipping a million microphones, you're on track. Have they all gone through this room? Uh, just about, yeah. So there, there, ah. are some, there are some capsules that aren't manufactured in this room, some of the electric capsules, uh, but just about, you know, every single true condenser microphone, absolutely, because this is where we manufacture the true condenser mm. capsules. That's where they're put together. So yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a lot of microphones go through that one little space there. Awesome. Including the ribbon elements as well, the NTR ribbon elements. Wow. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, it's a very sacred space. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> where it's, microphones it's cool. are born. Yeah, it's probably well, going to have to grow a lot bigger. I before think so. Too long, you know. But, um, yeah. Cool. Let's cool. Uh, move on to the next stage. All right. All right so what we see here mm -hmm. is the back plate, the raw part of a back plate of a microphone. So these parts here, the the kind of raw brass piece. Uh, this has been manufactured in that first room that we had a look at where the, the bodies of the microphones are made. Sure. So it's machined out of a solid piece of brass. Yeah, that is brass all right. Yeah. Beautiful. And then what we're doing here is we're actually injection molding plastic around the outside of that capsule. Now, the way that, as we've already explained, the way that a, a diaphragm works is you've got that diaphragm at the front, you've got the back plate, and you have to separate those but have them very close together uh, to actually you know, make the, the diaphragm do its, do its thing. That gasket is generally placed on top of a, of a back plate. Usually when you see a, a condenser mic, you've got the back plate, then a, a kind of gasket, and then the diaphragm. You can imagine how much inconsistency there'd be with a, with a gasket because it can get bent as you put it on, and it, you know, different heat thicknesses. changes it. Absolutely. So the way that we do it is with a super, super, super high resistance plastic uh, that's actually molded around the back plate. And then what we'll do from here is actually machine the metal down so that it's got the perfect gasket thickness every single time. Wow, great. So this machine here is actually the same kind of machine that they use to manufacture Lego, <laughs> which is kind of funny. That's great. You know? So it's a giant plastic Lego machine yeah. that makes precision moldings. Exactly. And it, I mean, if you think about Lego, you know, you can pick up a piece today and a piece that was made 30 years ago that's and right. bang, they'll click together. Click it's some together. of the most high precision plastics out there. And uh, that's why we're using the same machine to manufacture precision microphones. Fantastic. So, yeah. It's your NTG4 plus end cap. Good eyes. For sure.
but it kind of says so. Oh, right there, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, do I thought know. you were just picking it out. No, but I do. I, yeah, it's pretty awesome. You got the heads of NC5s here. Yeah. Um, even the, the end caps for Micon connectors. Yep. We manufacture it all here, so. Crazy. Here's your top ring for your NTG3. Brilliant. Top rings for NT5s, so that'll go in the, in the very top yeah. of the microphone. But yeah, all sorts here. But the really cool thing in this space is this little line here where we've got robotic arms that basically take that raw piece that we looked at just then, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the brass with the plastic around the outside, and turns it into this. Mm. And this is what a finished back plate looks like. Wow. Now, this one's been rejected. Uh, there might have been an issue as it went through the machine, but it's, it's a very high precision machine that'll get the, the top of this back plate to within one micron of flatness and twist. It's super, super high precision. Micron, one million. Micron. Yeah, yeah, straight up. So, so basically the idea with a back plate of a capsule if you've got inconsistencies on the back plate, that's where you'll test out a bunch of capsules and they'll all have a slightly different response. You know, you've got a different tension, you've got right. a different, you know, kind of height of the back plate. That's where you get inconsistencies. But with this machine here, this is the same kind of machine that they use for the manufacture of, of watches, for instance. Like really, really small, really high precision parts. And we use that to make the back plates because we know that we're going to get absolute consistency every single time. Mm. I mean, this one here, just rubbing your finger over the top will spoil the finish. Oh, of, wow. Of the, it's that fine. Back plate, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Wow, that is so fine, you're yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you can see the difference between something that's been machined on a, on a regular kind of machine, you yeah. can see the roughness compared to, to what you end up with there, and drilling those you know, tiny little holes, it's so precision. Yeah, you can see actually your fingerprints are yeah. scouring it. Yeah, exactly right. So wow. having that gasket machined, if you can kind of look on the right angle, you can see, you can see the gap here that's been placed around the outside, mm -hmm. and then that actual high resistance plastic is sitting just a little bit higher, and that's what that diaphragm is going to be screwed to, and that's how you get a really high precision full diaphragm assembly. Wow. So, yeah, that's how it's done. Fantastic. Cool. So what we got here are uh, some other components that have come from our machine shop. Mm -hmm. You'll be familiar with this line tube here. It's the line tube for an NTG-8. Wow, yeah. Feel how light that is. It's made out of aluminium, so it's super lightweight. Super fine. Yeah, and obviously when you've got a long microphone like that, at the end of a three meter boom pole. I know, I've held it. Things are gonna get heavy quick, yeah. so you want everything to be as light as possible. But right next to that, you can see a whole bunch of, um, of plastic injection molding tools. So we have our own tool making workshop and tool making refers to the actual molds that make the plastic. Now, a tool for a plastic part can cost upwards of, you know, four, five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, they can get very expensive and, and that tool will last the whole life cycle of a product. You might make a, you know, a million products through that particular tool. Um, but what we started doing recently is, is getting our own tool making team in so that we can do everything in house. Everything from the mold that will be used in the injection molding machines, the, the metal work and mm. everything. We can do it all in house and we can keep you know, absolute control of that. And it means that we can be really quick. If we want to make a little adjustment to a clip or something like that, we can do it straight away because we've got our, our own tool making workshop. So. Wow. And these things are super, super, super heavy. Each and one of these super, is kind of half I was going to say. Inside. It's got to be really expensive and oh, really yeah. heavy. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, yeah, that's that's a half and that's a half. So you need a kind of a full big mm. engine hoist kind of thing to be able to move them around. Right. So, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Let's uh, let's check out the paint line okay. upstairs. Yeah. So right here, you can see some of the environmental testing that we do at Road. So apart from actually getting products in the hands of users, letting them try them out, uh, as you probably know, we've got a 10-year warranty on a lot of our mics. Right. That's a pretty big commitment as a That's manufacturer. That's a large commitment. Yeah. So what we want to do is make sure that our mics are going to stack up to all sorts of different environments, even stand the test of time, just in studios, getting chucked around, all sorts of stuff. So that there's condensation on the inside of this, that means what? So this is a temperature and humidity programmable chamber. So what this is actually doing is making it super humid, then super dry, then super humid, and it's kind of simulating the effect of an environment over 10 years in the space of maybe a month. So are you putting an NTG4 in here? Absolutely, we'll wow. put every single, every product that we manufacture, we'll go through a, a, a 
environmental testing. And even every though, time we have a new revision of the product, it'll go through testing. So every revision of even the electrets go into something that's super Absolutely, humid and it yeah. still works after that? Yeah, well, it, it, perhaps not. And then we'll work on improving the, the microphone, you know wow. what I mean? So before we release a product, we want to make sure that it's going to stack up to a certain amount sure. of punishment. Um, uh, that happens with this super low-tech looking machine as well, which is a <laughs> salt a nice spray tester. So this will kind of just spray out really, really salty water uh, and try to oh, corrode yeah. the microphone bodies so we can test the paint surfaces, things like that. Um, we've also got vibration generators, which is like a big vibrating table that you place the mic on to test out the clips. The mic clips shock mount, see what oh, we're yeah. going to do. The stress of them. Um, yeah. So I this mean, is sort of microphone hell here. Yeah, this is right. where we try to break them and see how, they, <laughs> wow, see how that great. works out. Uh, but through this room here is actually the paint line. And we don't paint our microphones, we ceramic coat them. Mm. So one of the big things that you see when you purchase a microphone that's, that's painted, whether it's black or, or red or whatever color, it's actually just a painted microphone. Whereas what we do is we actually ceramic coat the microphone and bake it in an oven. And that means that you've got a really, really hard wearing finish. And 20 years down the track, it's still going to be the same color. And it's not going to be all scratched up from yeah. going in and out of shock mounts. All and my road microphones look pretty much like they did the day I got them. Absolutely. And the idea with the with the ceramic finish is that it has a really low sheen. It's got that, a, a nice kind of finish, a real satin finish, yeah. but it doesn't kind of polish up over time and get shiny. And obviously with an on-camera microphone, you know, if you're shooting somewhere where you might have a reflection or something, the last thing you, you want a is a bright, you know, kind of shotgun mic sitting just out of frame or something like that, especially for the Pro Series mics that are going to be right near the edge of a frame. That's right. You want it to not shine and sparkle. So having that ceramic finish makes sure that it, it stays you know, out of sight. So how awesome is it to have a microphone manufacturer that's thinking about the filmmaker and the film process, right? Exactly. That's great. Well, the thing is, you know, we, we make a lot of videos in-house. So like educational videos are a, a big part of, of our strategy. We want people to know why they need to use a shotgun mic, not just, you know, to pick up one. We want to show people, how do you use a shotgun mic? Why do you want to use it? And because we're using them every single day, you know, we need to make sure that they work for us as well. So sure. it's one of those things. Yeah, we, we have filmmakers in-house. We've got a team um, and they're, you know, a big part of the development process. What do you guys want? You know, what do they want to see? And then that's what we kind of all get together as this big kind of collective and talk about new products and all the different implications and that's how we end up with you know every single product that we have so, perfect yeah let's check out the paint line so it's pretty loud in here but this space is our paint line this big rack that you see here that's holding all the different microphones yeah yes these are pie tins <laughs> <laughs> it's the easiest way to stop any runoff yeah. um, this is quite a new microphone this is the video micro that we saw down in the machine shop sure. And basically we place the microphones on this big rack that's negatively charged, it's got a negative charge, and as the paint comes out of the nozzle, it gets a positive charge of 10,000 volts. And what that means is that the paint sticks to the microphone, it's wow. attracted to the microphone. This is all metal. That comes through here. Yeah, yeah, so this has got a negative charge, the paint gets a positive charge, and it's like, it's just attracted to it. No it means way. that we can get a perfect coating on the microphone, and we have way less wastage of paint, because the paint wants to stick to it, and wants to coat it properly. Wow. So. We could probably squeeze in and just see the paint process as it goes. So if you want to follow me through this treacherous little We're following area. You. So you can see here, this is the, the, the nozzle, this is the paint head. And that'll just kind of go all the way up and then it'll start spraying paint through. And these parts will start wobbling and spinning. And that means that we'll get a perfect coating on them. So that kind of action of, of spinning around the so whole thing as well that as happening internally. right there right now yeah so that you can see those ones have just been done it looks like the guys are maybe refilling the paint or, or changing something up at the moment uh, but there's a big water wall that goes behind it's like a waterfall that catches any of the paint runoff so that yeah. the environment in here stays healthy yeah um, but what's happening there is these, these microphones going through that charged paint will go through stick to the mic and then they'll head all the way around and, and bake in the oven which we can check out Beautiful. Yeah. Very confined spaces. And I mean, it's quite a comfortable temperature in here right now. Yeah. But consider that that is a giant oven. Uh, and we have to keep it all in a controlled space. So what we have to do is kind of heat the room and cool the room at the same time to keep it at the right level. Yeah. I mean, you feel the heat coming out of that. Microphones that are coming out of here are very hot, so you wouldn't want to actually touch them. But yeah. you can see right here at the edge, there's some finished microphones yes. that have been ceramic coated. And uh, they go in like this. You can see that's a blasted body. You can see how it's got nice surface area. Yeah. Um, 
all of these are kind of varying levels. They, they get kind of roughed up a little bit before they go in, and that's just so it's got more surface area and more adhesion to attach to. Yeah. Brilliant. So that's how we, we paint the microphone bodies. Everything from you know the NTG3 Black, the, the smaller video micros, NTG4, right. um, the NT1, they're all ceramic coated, not painted. Beautiful. So, crazy, huh? That's a great process. Mm. And it's environmentally happy because you're reusing paint that's running Absolutely, off and all yeah. of that. I mean, everything that we do, we, we minimize wastage. Even as the microphones are manufactured, you would have seen all that swarf mm -hmm. laying in front. Yeah. That gets sent back to the guys that we buy the bars from. They melt it down, they sell they it back to bar. us. So, you know, it's always running through and, and there's no, you know, kind of needless wastage in the process. Brilliant. Yeah. Great cool. stuff. Let's go check out the next stage. All right. Been yeah. Cool, huh? <laughs> now you can see here, this is the mic that's just come out of the paint line. That's the NT1. Yep. Quietest. Studio condensed mic in the world. Fantastic. Um, some of the smaller ones, like the uh, the video micro body. That's before it gets the the attachment that'll help you place it onto a smartphone. Perfect. Um, the shotgun mics you can see here in the rack this is the NTG Four Plus. That's the Four Plus, a little yeah. bit longer. There's and I mean, feel noise. how light that is. Wow. It's insane, right? It's like and not even an ounce, maybe yeah. in the ounce range. So I mean, Ooh. we want to make these as light as possible, so that it, you know when Poor guys like us have to hang on to the boom pole for two hours during an interview that runs over time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can see here as well some of the the screen printing of the of the road logo and the and the, the product name has been done in here as well. So uh, that's where. Now the is that done the same way with it with a or is that screen no, that's so, screen printed? Yeah. So it's not running right now, but this is a screen printing machine. Um, the way that it works is that. Well, this is a pad printing machine, excuse me. So basically, these pads here will pick up the, the print, which will be, you know, either the road logo or a product name, um, and it'll then stamp it onto the body of a mic. And the good thing about these being like a silicon kind of, is that they form to the shape of the body, and that's how you get a perfectly printed right. logo or, or really fine detail on the name of a product. Um, even though it's a rounded shape. Right. That was always a quandary to me. How did you get printing on a round? Yeah. So you just, you know, kind of pick it up with something that's really flexible and then it places just it down perfectly. It it. So, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. All right. So this section here is where we laser etch the serial numbers. Oh, the yeah. Product names on our microphones. So you see here, this is a NT1A. Mm -hmm. And the name of the mic wrote NT1A, the serial number, and the whole made in Australia tag there. And it's burned on here. It's burned on, it's never coming off. Right. So it's etched right into the body of the microphone. That's the important thing because people can register their warranty online. And 10 years down the track, if that's just a sticker, it might peel off. Right. You know, and we want to be able to trace any problem that we have with the microphone sure. back to the original manufacturing date and go, okay, is there something we could have improved or, or whatever? Um, we're constantly trying to improve the products. Uh, and the, the warranty system, when people register their warranty and then if anything goes wrong, even if, you know, they drop it and it breaks and, and we go, okay, well, maybe we can, you know, change this aspect of it or the shock mounting or something. But uh, the good news is we have way less than 1% returns on our products. Wow. Which is a, a, a very, very low failure rate. And that's, you know, a testament to all the, the testing that we do in-house. And that you do it all in-house as well. Exactly right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we... We don't deal with external suppliers that might just try to push things through, which might happen in other in other contexts. But here at Road, because we do everything in house, we've got complete control. We mm -hmm. can make sure that everything goes out yeah. up to spec. Brilliant. But these machines here are kind of cool. They're not running right now because uh, the factory is kind of closing up for the day. But you can see here these different kind of caddies there to hold the mics. Uh, and within a couple of seconds, a super high power laser will actually laser etch all of that information onto the microphone. Wow. See here. How long does it take to etch them? Oh, geez, probably about less than 10 seconds. I'd Whoa. say between five and 10 so seconds. So they're just yeah. turning pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, they turn. It's super fast, and you can just see the smoke coming off it, and everything is crazy. Wow. But uh, you can see here, this is a before etched and after. Mm -hmm. So it's got the gold dot on there, but this one's still blank, and then you can see, you know, once it's done. So. This one's waiting for its warranty. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> What's the biggest killer of microphones? Yeah, so the biggest killer of microphones is moisture. 
So any microphone basically operates with a very, very small gap that the electricity is passing through to generate the, the audio. Mm -hmm. You've got sensitive components in there. You can see all the control that we have in-house to make sure the moisture doesn't get into the microphones here. But when they go out in the field into really, you know, kind of humid environments, they get wet, they get rained on, and then they just get chucked in a bag without being dried off or right. left out to actually dry properly. That's when microphones go wrong. Uh, and that's why you have those... Road has the tubes yeah, that are exactly super right. watertight. Yeah, and we also ship every microphone with a little absorbent, absorbent pack, a little silica gel absorbent pack. The best way to store your microphone is to place it back in a bag with the absorbent pack and you know that it's always going to be fine. Right. Uh, it's still, they're, they're quite resilient, but if there is something that's going to damage your mic other than dropping it, it's going to be moisture. So if you're in a really humid environment, it's a really good idea to protect your mic from humidity. And if you happen to have a shotgun mic on your camera, it gets a little bit of rain on it, just pull the foam off and make sure that that dries separately from the microphone and you'll, you'll make sure that your microphone lasts forever. So here's a question. Mm. I'm using an NTG3. Yep. I have it on a boom pole. The scene's outside and it's below freezing. Yep. And the actors want to walk into a 20 degree room mm -hmm. inside. Yep. What's going to happen? What's my problems? Okay, so when you're freezing cold outside and then you go into a warm room that's probably got a bit of humidity because there's people in it, right. what'll happen is condensation on the outside of the microphone. Now, when you've got a, a foam windshield on there, usually your mic's pretty well protected because mm. the moisture's not going to get through that windshield into the sensitive components. But if you haven't got a windshield on or if you've just placed the microphone inside, you get condensation on the mic. Anytime yeah. you've got you know cold metal or, or glass or any shiny surface that's really cold in a humid environment, it's going to condense the air. That's just what so we don't have to worry it. about water inside the microphone condensing if we have that if shield. If you've got on the, the foam windshield on there. Right. Um, but what you will have to do is make sure that you, once the, the microphone's at the same temperature of the room, make sure that they, they do dry out before you put them away. But one consideration, if you if you are in a very cold environment, you come inside and, and you do happen to get a little bit of condensation in the microphone from the small amount of air that gets in there, uh, an NTG3 or an NTG8 is actually really resilient because they've got RF bias. Right. So rather than a voltage bias going across the, the diaphragm and the back plate, uh, it's got an RF bias. And, and with a voltage bias capsule, what happens is if, if small amounts of moisture get on the capsule, it shorts out the microphone and basically you've got no audio. You're done now. Yeah, or it'll, it'll crackle right as, as you get loud sounds. So with an NTG1, a 2, a 4. Yep, yep, or, or just about any, uh, any other microphone that doesn't have RF bias, uh, mm. which is the majority of all microphones that you'll see in the world. Sure. Um, they're more susceptible to be, to be shorted out by moisture than an RF bias microphone. Microphone, uh, because that RF bias has a, has a, a different resistance, and, and basically it's easier for the signal to continue coming through clean than it is to jump across that circuit and short out the microphone. Sure. So you end up with a really resilient mic. So if you are if you are shooting in extremely cold temperatures, and we're talking extremes here, you're in you're in like what? really humid environments. Like if you if you're shooting in a Bikram yoga studio, or or if you're out in the Antarctic or something, in these really extreme temperatures, you absolutely should be buying an RF bias microphone because you know it's going to keep working, and especially right. if, you, if you're going hiking somewhere in the snow. The last thing you want to do is, you know, get to halfway through your trip and your microphone stops working, you know. Uh, whereas with an RF bias mic, it's going to sustain, like, sustain the, the, the craziest temperatures and it will keep working. Fabulous. So, yeah. Cool. Good stuff. So let's check out the valve mic valve testing mic. areas. So the first little machine you see here, which is pretty cool, is full of little valves here. These are electroharmonics valves. Uh, they're wow. really nice valves. Uh, and basically what we do is with a couple of our microphones, we use a valve uh, that processes the audio signal. The audio will run through a valve, which gives it this nice kind of uh, even order harmonic distortion, which, which sounds really pleasing mm. to humans. When you've got, you know, kind of odd order harmonic distortion, like you do with a, with a solid state circuit, that's when it sounds really nasty when you get that kind of distortion, even the smallest amounts. Whereas when you add a little bit of even order distortion, uh, it, it sounds really pleasing. It sounds warm. It, it's the sound of, you know, old school music that you've been listening to your whole life. And, and analog rich, tape. Analog tape. LP kind of yeah. versus CD, yeah. that whole argument. Exactly. Right. So, so a couple of our mics, the NTK and the K2, mm. uh, and the recently discontinued Classic 2 uh, have valves in them. But one of the things with valves is that they can be quite sensitive. Um, and what we do to combat that is we burn them in for 24 hours. We mm. make sure that we let them run. They get up to operating temperature and cool down uh, and get it back up to operating temperature, and then we test them. 
and any that don't pass the test, which, you know, when you buy a, a good quality valve like this, usually they're all fine, but we still test them to make sure they don't end up in a microphone if they're not up to spec. So valves typically, tubes, valves yeah. are typically moody. They are. So how did you get over that? So the, uh, generally, if, if, a, if a valve is going to fail, it'll be very early in its life. Uh -huh. It'll be, you know, within the first couple of times of using it, heating it up, cooling it down, heating it up. These guys will actually test the valve before shipping it out. Perfect. Uh, a lot of manufacturers that are, you know, respectable manufacturers will. Uh, but just to, to be absolutely certain, we like to test them in-house ourselves. And that way we can make sure that every single road mic that goes out the door isn't going to have a valve in there that's, that's making, you know, a bit of noise or anything like that. All right. If it passes the test uh, in-house here, uh, it's it's basically guaranteed to, to work absolutely fine for years to come. Uh, but valves are a consumable part, you know, depending on the amount of hours the microphones run. Um, eventually, uh, you'll, you'll hear a little sure. bit of a difference, you might want to change your valve. Uh, but to make sure that you don't have to do that too soon, we actually put so, them in. Yes, and if that happens, what are we talking? Five years, 10 years, 15 uh, years? Look, it depends. I mean, if, you, if you've got a studio that, that's running, you know, the same mic, you know, kind of uh, eight hours a day or something like that. Um, you know, you might get, geez, you might get 10 years out of a valve before oh, you wow. replace it. So we're talking a long time for reasonable yeah. use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But but at the same time, you know, valves are moody. You might only get two years. It's, mm. it's a little bit it's a little bit of a, of a tricky thing to classify. But, but the uh, NTK and all the valve mics are 10-year warranty. Absolutely. We send it back. It's yeah. a and then we Absolutely. get it back. Yeah, that's, that's why we offer a warranty on our mics because we want people to have peace of mind that when they buy a mic from Rode, it's gonna work. Yeah. It's gonna do exactly what it does on day one, you know, at day 10,000. So, right. Um, the, the, the benefit though, um, with, with having a valve and, and getting that kind of harmonic distortion and everything only kicks in after you've warmed up the mic. So that's mm. another thing that you have to think about when you're when you So how long does it have to be on before you get that nice feel? Uh, I generally recommend about seven minutes. Seven minutes? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so you never want to just turn on your mic and start recording because the sound, you'll actually hear it. If you turn on your valve mic and start talking into it, you actually hear it kind of, the sound develop. It'll, it'll, mm. it'll just get richer. And then all of a sudden, when the valve gets up to operating temperature, it no longer changes. The sound won't change anymore. It happens within about three to four minutes, but to be absolutely certain, you want to kind of double that. You want to go seven, eight minutes. Wow, that's and brilliant that information. Right yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. There's some misconceptions out there. Some people warm up their mics for half an hour and I mean, they're just wasting their time after a certain amount of time. I'd hate to, to have my vocalist waiting for half an hour every time. But, <laughs> you know, if you're setting up, set your mic up first, turn it on, and then get your channel strip set up and everything, and by then you're, you're ready to record. But to get the best sound out of your valve mic, make sure it's nice and hot because that's where it's actually going to be doing the, the best work. Anything else we can look at? Yeah, sure. So right here, once the valves are placed into a microphone, <laughs> head up with a power supply. Look at this. And then we run the mic and the power supply at the same time because this power supply is powering up the valve in the mic. Perfect. Um, we want to make oh, sure that the power supplies are burned in. You can see, yeah, the yeah. valve mic's here. So we'll place them all on the rack, we'll turn them on, they'll run for 24 hours, and then they'll actually be checked the next day. So um, these have obviously already been tested, although will be tested tomorrow because the, the rack's not running right now. And you test them at two different voltages? So it depends which market they're, they're made for. So in Australia, we're running 240 volt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Europe, they're running the same. In the US, you're running you know, 100 volt or 120 volt, yeah. 110, there you go. Um, yeah, so we have to, depending on what market they've been manufactured sure. for, we'll test it at that voltage and make sure that it's, uh, that it's running fine. Wow, so, great. Yeah. And then from there, once we've got these microphones packaged up, they're laser etched, they've been tested, they're run in, every single microphone gets listened to before it leaves. So even though it can pass all the tests, you might have a, a little rattle in the microphone because mm -hmm. something hasn't been screwed in properly. It might pass all the electronic tests. So we'll pick up every mic, we'll shake it, we'll kind of talk into it, one, two. Some guys sitting there with headphones on doing this all yeah, day. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Wow. So we've got, you know, in this room here, we'll have, uh, you know, one or two people will, will it's, it's quite a quick test. I'll just give it the, the subjective test because it's past all the electronic tests. We know that it's performing how it should, but does it sound right? You know, is there something that, that you know, for some reason doesn't feel right about the microphone? Is there, as I said, like a little rattle? Is there something mm -hmm. that, for whatever reason, hasn't been wow. together properly? And that way, you know that every single microphone that leaves it has actually been listened to by somebody. And we can trace that back. We can make sure you know, that, that everything has been tested properly. Is it all microphones or just the two microphones? No, every single microphone. So a million microphones this year, some really actual living person is going to be shaking it going, hi, yeah. I love you, baby, come kiss me tonight. And exactly. oh, yeah, that doesn't sound right here. You see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's wow. just, you know, 
yeah, one, two, test, test, you know, shake it around, cool, next one, move them down the line, and, and you will listen to every mic. I mean, these mics here have, have just been listened to. So. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And that way <laughs> we make sure that not only are the electronics and then the capsules tested, they're put together, they then get a sweep through them the, through the mic mm. to make sure that it's it's within a tolerance, and then they'll get listened to, and then they get packaged and, and they go out. So that's how you make a good microphone. I, I, I get that. Yeah. So this is a crazy, crazy space. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't tell from a camera, but you know, you find out if you have ear ringing in your ears or not when you're in here, because it's, yeah. what's the, this is an anechoic chamber. What is yeah. that? So an anechoic chamber is designed to simulate what you call in the acoustics field, a free field. So the sound comes out of a source and it doesn't come back. Now, anytime you're in an enclosed space, um, I mean, even if you're outside, what happens is you speak, the sound reflects off the floor, it hits the walls, and it all comes back, and, and you get... Um, Primary, secondary, yeah. tertiary reflections. Exactly, all yeah. All that stuff. Um, and, I mean, that's the kind of thing that helps you understand where things are in space, like, uh, you know, uh, it's supportive reflections sometimes in a lecture theatre. If a uh, lecturer is away and you get an early reflection, it might help you, whereas reverberation in a room might be bad in some other instances. This is a space that's designed to have none of that, because what we want to do is hear what a, a um, transducer is actually doing. So you've got a microphone, you wanna know what that microphone is hearing when a, a sound is played out of a speaker. And what you don't want to know is what the microphone's gonna do when the sound bounces off a wall and off the ceiling and everything else. So if you wanna know the directionality of a microphone, for instance, like we got our, our shotgun mics mm -hmm. that cancel sounds from the side, pick up in the front, we wanna know exactly what it's doing at each frequency. And the only way to do that is to play a sound in this room through the mic as you kind of turn it around and you'll see the roll off pattern of what it's actually picking up. And that's how you build those polar charts that you see every yep. time you look at a microphone polar specification pattern. sheet. So how high, how high of frequency do you play in here? So we'll, we'll play, oh geez, just about every frequency you'll see on a test chart. So we'll go, often we'll spec microphones up to 16 kilohertz. 16? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, humans can hear up to 20 kilohertz if mm. they've got, you know, good hearing You're a baby. like they did when they were born. Yeah. <laughs> right. A lot of us wouldn't have that. Um, you know, even by the time we're about 20, you'll, yeah, you'll, right. you'll be losing your, your high frequencies or if you've been to a lot of loud concerts and forget about it, you probably lost a, <laughs> a lot more than, than 20K off the top. Um, but that's, it's kind of not about how high the frequency is. It's about knowing what a microphone does at, at certain frequency bands. So we'll test it at 500 hertz, mm -hmm. at 1,000 hertz, at 2,000 hertz. Uh, and that will give you, as a, as a user, an idea of what it's going to do to, say, a voice that's coming in from the side. Is it going to cancel? out that voice is going to cancel out the high frequencies and the low frequencies or just the low frequencies uh, what's the microphone going to pick up from behind you know so if you want a cardioid microphone that rejects sound from the rear you want to look at that polar response chart and go is it rejecting right. sound from the rear at all frequencies or can i live with it maybe not being quite so directional at lower frequencies we can test all of that in this room and that gives you as a user an idea of what that microphone is doing and, and that's how you spec up a microphone for the right situation you so know. for the construction minded and interested what yeah. is this stuff made out of so this is a kind of fiberglass that's at different kind of densities as it goes through um, the idea here with these wedges is that they're going to cancel out sound as it goes in it'll reflect Bang. around and, and disappear mm. um, there is a lower limit to what it will cancel this room is rated to around 100 hertz um, uh -oh. And this would be the quarter wavelength of 100 hertz, basically. Right. Uh, that is is more than enough for, for our kind of applications with microphones, especially a lot of microphones that are designed for singing or for, for broadcast speech recording. So you're not banging 40 hertz through this room and helping to get some kind of a... No, exactly right. And and especially with, with microphones... Um, you know, such as what we're, we're using. We've got high-pass filters on a lot of our microphones where you're cutting out a lot of low frequency. Sure. Um, and that's that's 100 hertz for a perfect cancellation. You then still have, you know, some absorption at, at, at lower frequencies below that. Oh, right. Um, but, for instance, to have a, a chamber that would cancel out all the way down to the lowest range of human hearing, which is 20 hertz, these things would be meters long. Yeah, you know, four or five big, times like, as long. And the room would still be the same size internally. The wedges would just go out much further and you'd need a lot more space. Right. Um, so did you build this? So so we actually had this this chamber designed and, and initially manufactured in Canada. Oh wow. And it was shipped from there all the way here in Australia in about four 40-foot containers. 
Uh, Whoa. And then the designers, the original acousticians who designed it, came out and, and kind of oversaw the construction of it. We had a lot of our own team come and help out. I mean, you can see this this floor is like a yeah. woven kind of suspended floor, and below that you've got more of these wedges, and the idea is that you want to cancel out everything all around. Right, because so, if this were just flat, then yeah. you've got a huge reflection coming up course, and all of yeah. this, right? So, uh, yeah. So this was cheap place. to build. Absolutely not. But, uh, <laughs> super it's inexpensive. Super expensive, but it's it's kind of the holy grail from microphone manufacturer to have a really good anechoic chamber because this is this is where you you find out what your microphone is doing. This is how you design a good microphone. You know, if you want to design a mic that has a particular characteristic, even even the frequency response of the mic, we can play a frequency sweep out through a speaker, pick it up in front of the mic, and we can know what the mic's doing. Wow. For instance, if you did that same sweep in a stairwell, have you ever noticed when you're standing in a stairwell how you hear that like really woofy kind of tone like the low frequencies are bouncing around because there's a standing wave in there what would happen on a microphone is if you put a frequency sweep through it would tell you the microphone's picking up heaps of bass even though it's not really it's the room the, the room space goes. is reacting this space right. won't react to those frequencies so, wow, right. so we can hear what the microphone's actually hearing Wow. So how many microphones do you test in here in a year? So we don't test every single microphone in this space. And this is more of a design and verification space. So we'll, we'll every single microphone, that, that every new capsule that we design, every body that we design is tested in here. It's kind of designed in here. It's made in here. Um, and then we'll batch test microphones. Every time we do a production run, we'll test one out of the batch because we've verified them all electronically, we've done the, the kind of spoken test, and we'll actually test the microphone to make sure that it's up to spec in terms of its frequency response and its actual uh, polar pattern, uh, the cancellation. Sure. Um, kind of increasingly more microphones as we go uh, because we've got more microphone models all the time. Sure. But, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things where we have to verify that the microphones are, are being manufactured you know, to our spec and we can do that in this space. So can I get Road to build me one of these in my house? I'm sure uh, we could put you in touch with the acousticians who designed it. <laughs> That's great. Uh, but for sure, I mean, it'd be a nice meditation space. Yeah, there. right, just a little space in the floor there and yeah. get down. <laughs> Ryan. Thank you so much for taking us through this whole massive facility. It's been an yeah. incredible education to know basically from stem to stern how a microphone is built here at Rode and how much care Rode takes in making sure we have the quality microphones to get out. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Cheers. Cheers.